Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we are so excited for you to join us for this session today. Um, this information is so important, and we are just so thankful um, for Dr. Valkoff for presenting. So with that, I'm going to hop off the screen, and I'm going to let you begin your presentation. Good morning. First of all, I want to thank Taka. I am very honored and gratified to be here with all of you with Taka today. And I'm very excited to share information with you. 45 years ago, I was actually delivering babies 24 hours a day at UCI Medical Center in Irvine. By the way, you're at the right session, but I was delivering babies 45 years ago. When I was a child, my dad was one of the first infertility obstetricians in the United States. We lived in Atlanta. He became very renowned for infertility. And every year for over 35 years, he had patients that would have to wait six months to come see him. They come to Atlanta and they're pregnant before he even treated them. What happened was the referring obstetrician would say, I can't help you. There's a miracle obstetrician in Atlanta. He cures infertility. You must go see him. When they heard that information, they relaxed. And the way the hypothalamus pituitary regulates the reproductive system normalized. Now, certainly not every case of infertility was healed that way, but my dad had at least 25 cases a year for decades that worked that way. So when I was a child growing up, it was dinner table conversation that the brain and body work together. The mind definitely can influence the body. So my interest in medicine as a kid was the mind and the power of the brain. So today we're going to, I, oh, obviously I changed my medical career 42 years ago, pretty dramatically. Uh, love delivering babies, but my passion and destiny was what we're going to talk about today. And we first started treating ADHD. And then back in the mid nineties, a mother called me and says, Dr. Velkoff, you helped a friend of mine's son who had ADHD really helped him a lot. I want you to treat my son with autism, with neurofeedback. I said, you know, I really would love to help you, but I have no experience in using neurofeedback and treating autism. This is the mid nineties. But when she described her son, he only spoke in two word sentences, but he also was hyperactive, impulsive, and couldn't focus. He had all the core symptoms of ADHD as part of his being on the spectrum. So I told her, I said, look, I don't know if we can help his autism symptoms. So let's do this. It's normally 50 treatments for autism spectrum disorder. Back then, today it's 42. Let's just do 20 treatments and see if we can at least improve his core symptoms of ADHD, not the autism. Before he got to 20 treatments, this child was speaking in seven word sentences. Well, that opened, it opened my eyes and opened the doors where we could now start helping autism. So this started back in the mid nineties with autism. And since then, we've been through many evolutions of technology brain mapping, neurofeedback, even neurostimulation. So I'm going to share with you uh, in this brief session what I have learned. And please, I'm happy to help you with any questions at the end. So let's, let's get started. Now, with autism, you know that there can be GI issues. There can be inflammatory processes going on. There can be biomedical deficiencies. All of those have to be addressed and treated successfully. But ultimately, we still have to go back to the brain because the brain is where it all starts. Your brain controls everything. It not only controls your physiology, your body, but it also, as I learned from my dad's work in infertility, but it also controls itself. So even though there are GI issues that need to be addressed, biomedical issues, inflammatory processes, we're focusing on the brain today. And we utilize the brain's capacity to form new connections in the brain using through the process of neuroplasticity. If you're 80 years old and you start learning a foreign language, your brain is gonna develop new synaptic connections through neuroplasticity. When in childhood, neuroplasticity is, is greatest. Now, through neuroplasticity, the brain can change itself. It can rewire itself in a much healthier, more functional manner, which I'm going to explain. 
And neurofeedback, it's also called, back in the 1980s, uh, we called it EEG biofeedback. Then when quantitative EEG brain mapping came available, it began to be called neurofeedback. It's based on operant conditioning. We're rewarding healthier brainwave activity that we want to see more of. The child is rewarded visually and auditory. And we're ignoring brainwave activity that is that is dysregulated and abnormal. We're only going to reward the positive brainwave activity. And I can summarize neurofeedback to you very, very easily. If the brain is able to see the results of what it is doing, it can change its activity and it can begin to regulate itself in a much healthier, more functional pattern. That's the essence of what we do with neurofeedback. And there are four different types of brain waves we look at. Delta waves are the slowest brain waves of all, one to three to four cycles per second. You produce delta when you're, deep, you're in deep sleep. Theta is also what we call a slow brain wave. It's four to eight cycles per second. Theta, you're drowsy, daydreamy, unfocused. Ever had an experience where you're driving on the, on the road and for about five minutes and suddenly you don't remember the last five minutes, you're probably driving in theta. Don't drive in theta. But that's, that's, that's what theta is like. Alpha is another slow brain wave. If you close your eyes and relax, your brain should go into alpha, particularly in the posterior part of the brain. When you meditate, you produce a lot of alpha brain waves in the back part of your brain. Your brain is in an idling state of relaxation. So delta, theta, alpha are very slow brain waves. They're very important in certain times of day. Theta and delta are very important when you sleep tonight. Alpha is very important when you want to relax. Now, beta waves are 12 to 30 cycles per second. But beta waves, 12 to 18 cycles per second is optimal. You're calm and focused. If you're producing a lot of beta brain waves, 20 to 30 cycles per second, your brain is overstimulated. You're probably going to have anxiety, irritability with children. They have tantrums, meltdowns, or you'll have trouble sleeping. So these are the four types of brain waves we look at. And we look at two aspects of the brain functioning. One is we want to make sure that you're producing the right proportion of brain waves. You don't want too many or too few of any, any one type of brain wave. Think of the concept of a muscle, your bicep muscle. You have to lift up an object. Your muscle needs a certain amount of tension to contract to lift up that object. If there's not enough tension in the muscle, you can't use the muscle to lift up an object. That would be analogous to very slow brain waves. If you have too much tension in the muscle, the muscle is going to over contract. It's going to go into a cramp or a spasm. It's also dysfunctional. So think about we don't want too many slow brain waves nor too many fast brain waves. We want everything to be balanced. And Children with, on the autism spectrum, have abnormal brainwave activity. They have never experienced what normal brainwave functioning is like. They have no reference point of what normal is. When a child on the spectrum does something impulsively, inappropriately, even a child with ADHD does something impul impulsively, inappropriately, I want you to understand that they're behaving normally for their brain. That's the way their brain has always worked. So when you criticize a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder, we're talking about autism right now, they're not going to have very good insight into why they're being criticized because they're behaving appropriately for their brain. But maybe their brain is not filtering and pausing impulses or they have very low tolerance for emotional regulation. Transitioning can be very threatening to them and they go into a fight or flight reaction or a meltdown. So the way they're behaving is normal for their brain, but their brain is not regulating normally. They don't know what normal is yet. Neurofeedback is gonna provide information to their brain of what more optimal normal functioning is so they can begin to do that more and more. And when they get rewarded for it, the brain wants to do more of it. Now, I, I want to show you, uh, this is like a, a little bit more than four minutes. It shows you the actual procedure of brain mapping. That's the brain map cap on the patient's head. There are 19 areas that we record brainwave activity from. And then you're going to see a patient doing neurofeedback where the brain map cap is on their head 
and they're working on improving the connections in the brain. The biggest problem with brainwave activity and autism is the connections in the brain are very dysregulated. The different areas of the brain are not communicating appropriately. So you're going to see first, after we show the brain mapping, you'll see neurofeedback where he's improving the connectivity in the brain. And then at the end, you'll see neurofeedback on the surface of the head where we're training the arousal level of the brain to have the brain at the appropriate arousal level. This is the first step in our treatment of autism spectrum disorder. We're recording the electrical activity of the brain and we're seeing what's called the EEG on the screen in front of the patient. Our brain only weighs several pounds, yet it uses up 20 to 40% of all the body's blood glucose is utilized by the brain to create electricity in the brain. And that's what we're recording on the EEG. Once the recordings are completed, it's been processed through a normative database. And we're monitoring and recording 19 channels on the head, and you'll see 19 rows on the computer screen. This EEG data is in, again, processed through our normative database, comparing to patients the same age who are healthy without symptoms. It helps identify if any areas, regions, or what's called networks of the brain are dysregulated that's linked to the patient's symptoms. We then develop out a customized neurofeedback protocol based on this recording to help the brain move to a healthier and healthier function. Once we complete the recordings of the brain waves, then we analyze it through the normative database. And the results show here that this patient's brain is stuck in a very abnormal slow pattern in the central portion of their brain. This pattern is analogous to your brain is offline. It's not processing information. We want to help the patient shift the brain and reduce that slowing into a more optimal functioning state. That's why the brain mapping is so critical. We wouldn't know where to treat or how to help this patient without knowing where the problem was. We've analyzed the patient's brain map and we've created a customized neurofeedback protocol to help this patient improve their brainwave activity that's gonna improve brain functioning. The EEG recordings are connected to a brain computer interface that converts the EEG into a video game with auditory and visual feedback so the patient is learning how to improve brain activity that will improve brain functioning. In autism spectrum disorder, it, there are abnormal functional connections in the brain that, that produce symptoms. It diminishes brain functioning. In the brain map analysis, we can look at 11,000 plus functional connections in the brain. We then see if any of those connections are not working normally that are linked to specific symptoms the child is experiencing. The patient can then learn to improve brain activity that will improve brain functioning. When the cheetah is moving across the screen on the top row towards the right, and you hear a bell go off, every second that occurs, the patient is now producing a healthier brainwave pattern. We want to get the brain out of the abnormal state it's in and start having it develop into a much healthier functional state. And that's what the feedback is telling the patient. When that sheet is moving across the screen, whatever you're doing in your, in your mind, keep doing it, it's working, it's working. You do this over and over and over and you will significantly improve functional connections in the brain, which will reduce symptoms. This is the other type of neurofeedback we do in treating neurodevelopmental disorders, autism spectrum disorder, ADHD. The brain doesn't know what normal is. And in the autism patient, the brain doesn't know what, what normal is. If we give the brain more information about how it's working, it can use that information to work in a much healthier, more optimal functioning pattern. So again, the electrode is recording his brain waves. It's connected to a computer brain interface that converts his brain with activity into a computer game that he can work with. Every time the fish jumps in the river, an auditory tone goes off and he gets a point on the screen because he's producing a healthier brain wave during that moment. If the fish does not jump into the river, there's no auditory feedback, he's not being rewarded. So he's only being rewarded when his brain is working in a healthier pattern. 
literally increasing the size and numbers of synapses in the brain that improves also connectivity in the brain that create a much stronger, healthier brain function. Okay, let me, uh, th we also, uh, with, with autism kids, we can also show a movie as the feedback. You bring in a DVD, put the DVD in the computer, but the movie only starts playing when the child is producing healthier brain waves. If the brain goes back to an unhealthy state, the movie starts going dark and the volume goes down. So to keep watching the movie, you have to shift your brain into regulating much more, much more optimally. We found the movies are wonderful for kids on the spectrum. Now, everything starts with the brain mapping. We cannot effectively help a child develop to their fullest potential without a brain mapping. If I go to the emergency room and I have chest pain, they're going to do an electrocardiogram, an EKG of my chest, probably take a chest X-ray. They want to study what my heart is doing. Well, if you have symptoms of a neurodevelopmental disorder, you, we need to know what the brain is doing. And this is a brain mapping of a patient uh, on, the, on the spectrum that had severe difficulty with socializing, not picking up on social cues, not able to reciprocate social conversation, to be brutally honest and not realize that what this individual was saying was offending other people. And then when the person, and then when this individual patient is criticized for saying things inappropriately, the patient becomes very defensive because they're speaking the truth. So this is a brain mapping of someone on the spectrum. And if you follow me now, if you look at the top row, I hope you can see the cursor. This is your, this is looking straight down on top of your head. This is your nose, your right ear, your left ear. These 19 dots are where we have electrodes recording brainwave activity. For example, this dot and this dot are right in the middle of your forehead. This dot's the very top of your head. These two dots are in the back of your head. Now, just to show you, Expressive language comes from the left frontal part of the brain. Receptive language is this area left posterior. So if a child's to have normal wiring in the brain to develop full language skills, left frontal has to be normal, left posterior has to be normal, and these two areas need to be linked together, working together in what's called coherence. This whole area back here behind the left ear is reading, reading comprehension. Now, the whole frontal part of the brain is involved in focus, concentration, emotional regulation, impulse control. The area, let's go down to 12 hertz, this area behind the right ear. This is the most important area in autism in understanding social cues, nonverbal social cues. It makes you aware of other people. How what you say or do affects other people. Reading people's intentions correctly area behind the right ear. Now, HZ means hertz, again, cycles per second. Again, as I said earlier, one to four is delta, four to eight is theta, et cetera, 12 to 30 is beta. This brain map is processed through what's called a, an FDA approved normative database. We use the gold standard normative database. So, it tells us if any areas of the brain are not functioning within normal limits. And at the bottom of each brain map, it has negative three to three. These are standard deviations. Normal functioning activity range is anywhere between negative two to plus two is a normal range. We want everything to be green. Now, this child was, very, was actually too low in delta. If you're too low in delta, it's like not having enough brakes on a car. Believe it or not, you need to have a certain amount of slow brain waves for the brain to have inhibition, but you don't want too many slow brain waves. This patient had was too low in delta. This pattern is very uh, commonly will cause very low frustration tolerance, anxiety, trouble sleeping. This child had none of those difficulties. So. Since the low delta was not causing symptoms, we decided not to treat it. We only treated her back here. If you look at the cursor here at 12, if you look at 12 hertz, this brownish color behind the right ear, at 12 hertz, that part of the brain is offline. It's not functioning. 
it's in a resting state, so it's not able to do its job. We treat the patient, in those days, this was from years ago, before we had some of the more uh, advanced technology we have. This is just pretty much basic neurofeedback based on brain mapping. And we want to get this child's brain functioning normally, get it out of that excessive alpha state back here to normal functioning. And I'll show you, this is her brain after 42 treatments on the right. And, you, and then we only treated her back here at 12 hertz. And as her, her brain reorganized through neuroplasticity to get this area working more normally, the whole brain reorganized. And you can see actually even the, the slow brain waves in Delta improved. The one on the left is a, a pre-treatment brain map. This is post-treatment brain map. Now, this brain map on the left it is telling us what the brain needs. It's screaming at us what, what the brain needs. So that is the blueprint of how we help every single individual. Now, when that fish jumps in the stream, this child just produced a healthy brain wave. And I can't, you can't see it clearly on this slide, but there's a point on the bottom part of the screen and they get a point. So, and by the way, neurofeedback, it's non-invasive, it's, it's painless, and it's recording what the brain is doing every milli, every second, every milli, it's recording what the brain is doing. And this screen with the auditory feedback, it's a neurophysiological feedback loop to the brain. So the brain is seeing the results of what it's doing, so it can begin to modify and improve its own activity. Kids love this, by, by the way. Now, the audio-visual feedback is telling the brain when it's moving in the desired direction into the desired pattern or not. Again, positive feedback rewards when it's moving in the right direction. There's no reward, no points on the screen, uh, no auditory reinforcement if it's not producing the right brain wave. The child is getting points on the screen accompanied by the auditory tones. The rewards are the positive reinforcement, operant conditioning for improving brain functioning. Neurofeedback can actually increase the size and number of synaptic connections in the brain, which translates into improved brain functioning. With repetition, the brain learns to sustain these healthier patterns on its own. That's why it takes at least 42 sessions to stabilize these improvements. Now, I want to show you one more. This is just a brief uh, news, news clip, but it shows more in, in live action the, the neurofeedback, how it works. Every morning, Seth Munger takes his pill. Seth calls it his ADHD pill. The medication has become a way of life to help him focus, concentrate, and control himself something that Seth's mother said was all but impossible to the eight-year-old who was recently diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. He was kicked out of every preschool, but and when he got into second grade, they were going to kick him out. And so at that point, we decided to go to the doctors. Seth had no friends. He did so poorly in school. When he had two good days, his grandmother framed this certificate and hung it on her wall. Every day he would have an outbreak. If a toy was out of place or something, you would want to make sure that that's fixed because he was going to have a tantrum. The medication helped, but at a cost. When I seen him on the medication, he lost his little soul. He wasn't himself. He had no personality like we were taking away his childhood. Seth's family found the Drake Institute of Behavioral Medicine in Southern California. Here, Dr. David Belkoff treats kids like Seth with neurofeedback. He calls it physical therapy for the brain. When you do a brain mapping of the child, we determine we can determine which area is out of balance that's causing the symptoms. The beeps you hear mean that Seth is producing a normal, healthy brainwave pattern. You're getting those neurons, those brain cells, to start firing more normally. So when you do it over and over and over, it, the brain begins to reorganize and readjust with how it functions. It's almost like readjusting a the thermostat. How do you think it's helping you at school and at home? Well, I concentrate really. After six weeks of therapy, Dr. Velkov has lowered the dosage of Seth's medication by 25%.
and they're not finished yet. Are you advocating that children not take medication? No. And no. only turn to this no. kind of no. No. But we want to we want to minimize how many children have to be on these drugs. And those that are on the drugs, we want to be able to reduce the amount of medication that they're on. We got a little character to himself. He started wearing the hats and kids say hi to him and buy him places. How does that yeah. make you feel? It makes me feel really good for him. Seth has friends now. He made a turnaround in school. And at home, he and his mom can finally enjoy some quiet time. Thelma yeah. Gutierrez, CNN, Northridge, California. Okay, you know, when kids come to us with neurodevelopmental disorders, they do not have a level playing field. And it's the way their brain has always worked. If you improve brain functioning, you can, you can level the playing field for them. Now, the neurofeedback you just saw on that spot, that was treating the arousal of the brain, improving the arousal level of the brain to more normal functioning. We also, though, look at brain networks with neurofeedback today. In fact, it's really ultimately even more important than the arousal level if, when children are on the spectrum. Neurons or brain cells function in groups called networks. There are billions of neurons involved in networks. And neurons in different parts of the brain carry out specific functions. And these different networks communicate with each other. This communication or connectivity is measured in the QEG brain map with what's called coherence between areas. So each of these 19 locations perform specific functions, but each area communicates with the other 18 areas. It's called coherence. So the brain can process thousands of bits of information instantaneously to process information to make everything work. Every, like if you want to have normal language uh, skills, wiring, the left frontal and left posterior need to be wired together, need to be linked together. Wherever you see a blue line, by the way, this, this is a brain map of an ADHD child. Wherever you see a blue line, it means the, the functional connections are very weak, they're very poor. So these areas are not communicating with one another, they're not sharing information. So there are enormous holes in this child's processing information. The blue lines means hypo, H-Y-P-O coherence. The analogy I use is, let's say in a company, we have 19 engineers given a project to complete together, but each engineer is given a different task to do for that project. But each engineer must be communicating what they're learning and finding with the other 18 engineers. So all 19 engineers findings are included to complete the project. Well, let's say 12 of these engineers speak different languages and they cannot communicate what they're finding their information is left out. Well, the project will go, will go incomplete. That's how this child's brain's working. Now, the good news is there are two ways you can effectively treat this and help this. One way is with our technology in 2023, we can keep the brain map cap on the patient's head like you saw in the first video, and the patient can retrain all 19 areas of the brain to work in coherence. If you get the brain to work in coherence over and over and over, your brain will rewire that way. We've seen wonderful improvements in just four to five weeks treating the whole brain. And that's just coming in several times a week. Accelerated treatment, you can see changes in a few weeks. Now, we have an additional technology we also use with some of our patients to further enhance neurofeedback. It's not neurofeedback. It was developed off the concept of neurofeedback, but it's neuromodulation or neurostimulation. It's electromagnetic pulse energy stimulation and then very mild, weak electrical current stimulation. Uh, these treatments are used in medical schools today worldwide. I compare neurostimulation to putting training wheels on a child's bicycle. Training wheels immediately give the child balance on the bicycle. As the child rides a bicycle balanced, being supported by the training wheels, their brain quickly adapts to how balance feels. It starts replicating it and controlling it now without training wheels. So 
I could develop out a protocol for this child and we could put a sensor in the frontal part of the head and the back part of the head. And I could develop out a protocol to stimulate all these areas firing in normal coherence for 15 minutes. So for 15 minutes, we can stimulate the brain to a much healthier normal pattern. As that's occurring, their brain quickly adapts to that pattern. It starts copying and creating on its own. You just needed to show the brain what to do. With neurostimulation, we've seen some really remarkable improvements in just two to three weeks, and that's just coming in two to three times a week. So we, we don't use it with all of our patients, but we use it in some of our patients. I, I want to show you a brain map, uh, neurostimulation, again, training rules on a bicycle. I want to show you this brain mapping because it just shows you how clinically helpful neurostimulation can be. This is a child with Tourette's disorder where... Uh, the child has motor and vocal tics. Motor tics, your face can be twitching, eyes are blinking, your shoulder is jerking. Vocal tics, you could be clearing your throat, making noises or sounds. The child also had ADHD and the child had severe anxiety and on an antidepressant called sertraline, the generic for, for Zoloft. On sertraline, the child is less anxious, but still anxious. And this is the initial brain map, the summary page we give the parents. It summarizes delta, theta, alpha, beta, high beta. Uh, the other, ch the child I showed you with uh, autism had too many slow brain waves. This child's the opposite. This child had fast brain waves. You go down to beta and high beta, you see this yellow brownish color in beta and high beta. The child's brain's overstimulated. Remember the example I gave, a muscle is overstimulated, too much contraction, he goes into a spasm or a cramp. It's dysfunctional. Well, too much beta also is dysfunctional. This high beta is driving the anxiety and the tics. Even on sertraline, the child's still anxious. Go down to coherence, you see all red lines in coherence. Red lines are different. It's called hypercoherence. The areas are talking to each other, but each of the 19 locations is doing the same thing. There's no differentiation. It'd be as if all 19 engineers do the same assignment. So basically, nothing gets done. It's noise in your head. We have been extremely successful for 30 years treating kids with Tourette's disorder, helping them reduce motor tics. We've even had some kids fortunate enough to even eliminate all their motor tics. We've not been successful, though, in helping vocal tics, unfortunately, with neurofeedback. Patient comes in, starts off on neurofeedback. I develop out the protocol. After 10 treatments of neurofeedback, the child is only mildly improved. So I decided with my staff, we're going to move this child on to neurostimulation sooner than I normally would. I wrote out the protocol. Eight treatments later of neurostimulation, this child no longer had vocal tics. I have never seen anything like that in 30 years. She, the child's still having motor tics, but they're much less frequent and much, much milder. And now the child has no anxiety at all, so the sertraline was reduced. We re brain map right away, because I need to see where's the child's brain now. I need to know where the brain is now to develop out the next protocol, not where the brain was before treatment. And this is the brain map. This is after two and a half weeks of neurostimulation, the one on the right. One on the left was before neurostimulation. This is two and a half weeks later, only eight treatments. And we can see the beta and the high beta have markedly reduced from what it was over here on the right. Remember, the color bar on the right, the darker color is more abnormal. So the beta now is almost normal. High beta is moving closer to normal. Most importantly, whole coherence now on the right is normal. No lines is normal. This one blue line over here is inconsequential. So fully connected, coherent brain. This happened in only eight sessions. Neurostimulation get the brain healthier faster than neurofeedback can, but there are advantages of neurofeedback and there are advantages of neurostimulation. So we use both technologies. The advantage of neurofeedback is the improvements are self-generated by the child. That's why the improvements are long lasting. The downside though of neurofeedback is if the brain is severely dysregulated, there's a limit of how much the brain can improve itself using its own resources. The advantage then of neurostimulation is neurostimulation could care less how dysregulated your brain is. We can stimulate the brain to a much healthier, optimal pattern. The downside, though, of neurostimulation is some of the improvements may not be long lasting 
unless you follow it up in neurofeedback where now it's self-generated by the patient themselves. So if we do neurostimulation, we then follow it with another course of neurofeedback, but we, we're gonna, we use the most advanced neurofeedback technology in the world in treating the connectivity of the brain the connectivity between different networks in the brain and within neurons within networks is critical to optimal brain functioning. Brain connectivity is very impaired in autism spectrum. So through the brain mapping, we can identify which networks are dysregulated linked to symptoms. There are three different networks in the brain involved with autism. And this is a side view of the left half of the brain, the right half of the brain. These are called Broadman areas of the cerebral cortex. Back in 1908, a very famous German neurologist, Dr. Broadman, was able to discover what every region of the cerebral cortex does, identify its specific wiring and what functions it controls. And he numbered them from one to 52, called Broadman areas. For example, uh, left frontal and right frontal, 10, 9, 8, 6. A left front and right front is involved with focus, concentration, and emotional regulation, impulse control. 44 and 45, left frontal is Broca's area of the brain. This is expressive language. 39, 40, 41, 42 is auditory processing uh, involved in receptive language. So if the child is gonna have normal language, it is gonna be able to develop normal language skills, you have to have normal wiring. And 44, 45, 41, 42, 40, 39, all need to be working together on the left side. Now, on the right side, the right posterior part of the brain is the most important area in processing nonverbal social cues. 19, 38, 37, 38, 40 are critical for processing nonverbal social cues in autism for anybody, but they're the most important at work in, in autism. So we can identify what broadband areas are abnormal linked to the child's symptoms. And we can actually do neurofeedback now. It's called SW Loretta neurofeedback of broadband areas where you can actually train the connections between broadband areas deep in the brain. In fact, we even can now treat the cerebellum with neurofeedback. Cerebral cortex has maybe 100 billion neurons. Cerebellum has 60 billion neurons. And they used to think the cerebellum was primarily coordination, motor skills, balance. No, that's only a small part of what the cerebellum does. Cerebellum is very much involved in autism and ADHD. It has connections to the frontal lobe of the brain. Through SW Loretta, we can actually train those connections and you can improve the connections between broadband areas. We have found that at least 95% of the child's symptoms are due to abnormal connectivity or coherence between broadband areas. And we now treat that. It's major breakthrough. And we typically do this in at least the last third of treatment. So to summarize right now, Patients can improve their own brainwave activity by strengthening connections in the brain within networks and between networks. Improving the connectivity in the brain, you've opened up more channels for information. So the brain is processing much more information than it ever could before. And again, helping the brain regulate, improve its overall functioning improve brain functioning, you're going to have better attention, social awareness, language, mood, behavior. And one more important fact, when we treat patients with neurotherapy, they, their brain is then better wired to benefit from all the other therapies, whether it's ABA, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, social skills therapy. You improve the wiring of the brain, they're going to, they're going to develop much more from there are other therapies. You want to jump over a hurdle, you've got to have muscles developed to jump over a hurdle. Well, if you want to learn new skills, you want to have optimal wiring in the brain so you can learn those, those, those skills. I hope this information ends up being very helpful for all of you. This is just uh, information about contact. Very importantly, 
If you live in California, we're now able to do remote treatment and training. We typically reserve it for people that live more than 50 miles from either our clinic in West LA or Irvine that we can actually do remote treatment now. Where uh, you use the equipment from us and uh, we do it through Team Viewer, and it's very, very effective and certainly much more uh, convenient. I'm happy to help you all with any questions that uh, you may have. Perfect. Thank you so much for all of that information. We definitely have a couple of questions. Um, so I am going to find the first one here. Can you talk a little bit about um, age groups? Would this work with young adults? Does it work with younger children? What have you noticed? It, we start treating at about three and a half to four. Nicole, we started treating children about four years old, three and a half. Um, so far, we started treating about three and a half. My oldest patient was 103 years old, not, not, not with autism. It was my dad. <laughs> my dad, uh, when he was 103, uh, we have patients that we treat. We have a lot in 20% of our patients are adults. It works at any age. We may start treating younger, but right now we don't start treating until about three and a half to four. Perfect. Um, another question about how many sessions of neurofeedback do most patients need and how is that determined? Well, it's determined by the, the severity of the symptoms and the brain mapping. Uh, for ADHD, you need a minimum of 34 treatments. If you're on a lot of medications, you're going to need more than 34 if you want to be able to have a chance of reducing significantly the medications. Autism, you need a minimum of, 40, of 42 treatments. We have, uh, if you're nonverbal, you're probably going to need more than 42. I had one patient on the autism spectrum, probably the most remarkable patient ever treated. He had over 150 treatments. When the parents brought their child to us, he was on eight different medications, dosages that were, that were inappropriate to put a child on. And the medicating physician was now trying to get him institutionalized. They were desperate, they brought him to us and I was able to titrate him off every single medication that took more than 150 treatments. That's unusual, but that was a pretty inspirational case. Uh, most people just, you need a minimum of 42. It may go more, it just depends on the severity and what shows up on the brain mapping. Perfect. Um, this is also a great question. Are you able to do neurofeedback with a child that is sensory defensive to anything on his head? And can you get around this issue? That's a great question. The first, if they're sensory sensitive, the first thing we do is we'll do a practice, we'll loan the parents a practice electrode where they can, it's like an ear clip on the ear and you put it on your ear, let your child see it on your ear and then put it on his ear. We want the child to get comfortable with that for a few days and they come in the clinic for a trial treatment. And I'd say maybe half of children doing a trial treatment will do fine and we know we can accept them into the treatment program. If they don't do well, uh, we'll repeat the trial treatment again. And we'll do up to four trial treatments. As long as they keep improving every time, we'll keep, there was one child, I think we did about nine trial treatments before we accepted the child in the treatment. That was unusual. But the child kept improving every time, but not enough where we felt comfortable that we could treat him. By nine treatments, the symptoms already were improved before even starting the program. Uh, but usually we'll go up to four trial treatments. Uh, it's not uncommon, you know, uh, it's common for kids on the spectrum to have sensory processing uh, disorder. We see it all the time. But they get more comfortable every time we do a treatment, every time we do a trial treatment. Now, we may not get a brain mapping of the child for five to 10 treatments if they really have a hard time, but that's okay because we have a generic protocol we start every child off with on, on the spectrum. And usually by five to 10 treatments, they're comfortable getting a brain map done. Perfect. And then we have a couple questions like this. Did, um, do you need like booster sessions after you determine how many sessions they would need? Or like, is it permanent or do you have to keep going back to, to get neurofeedback? Well, I've learned in medicine and psychology, I also have a master's degree in psychology before I went to medical school. I never use the word permanent, but I can tell you that uh, most patients 
that we treat do not have to come back for treatment. Now, we, we're now following patients for 12 months after discharge. It, it's really infrequent they have to come back. If we do everything the first time that they, that they need improved, uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, booster sessions were more common, but with the advancements of the technology, and now with SW Loretta neurofeedback, it's uncommon someone has to come back. I can only speak for our clinic. I can't speak for uh, for other other providers. Perfect. Um, my son has frequent staring spells and motor and vocal tics. Is neurofeedback something that would help issues like that? You said uh, staring spells? Yeah, staring spells and motor and vocal tics. Motor and vocal tics, the answer is yes, staring spells. First of all, he should have a, a, a diagnostic EEG with a neurologist to be sure he's not having seizures and not having seizure activity. Uh, over half of kids on the autism spectrum are going to have abnormal EEGs. They, can, they have abnormal epileptiform activity, not necessarily a seizure, but abnormal epileptiform activity. It's very common on the spectrum. Even if the child has seizures, we can also help that with neurofeedback. In fact, neurofeedback, before it was ever used for ADHD or autism, was used for treating intractable seizures that even anti-convulsant medication could not could not stop. It was first used to help seizures. So yes, the child is treatable, but they should get a workup to rule out a seizure disorder first. They may need to be on medication too. Perfect. And another great question. Are there any specific credentials um, slash specific training to look for in providers doing neurofeedback? So pretty much how to find a good provider. Uh, well, you want to be sure that they're a licensed professional in the state that you live in. They need to be licensed, either a licensed physician or licensed psychologist or therapist, MFT therapist. And um, that, will, that, that would be first. And you want to know what their training is in, in neurofeedback, biofeedback, QEG brain mapping. How long have they been doing it? how many patients have they helped, and just trust your intuition. Perfect. Um, have you seen, is this effective on severe autism? Uh, it's not, when severe, I would have to know how low, fun, the age of the child and how low functioning they are. We have helped severe low functioning autistic children they may only improve 20, 25%, that's all. Whereas a, a, a level one or level two autism child may improve anywhere from 30 to 99%. Uh, level three, severe level three may only improve 20, 25%. But to that child and to the parents, it's life-changing. Perfect. Do you recommend any testing to be done prior to starting? It's not necessary. We do our own evaluations, but we may uh, we may refer for uh, additional testing sometimes, or I may refer to a neurologist to get a, a diagnostic EEG to rule out rule out epilepsy or seizure disorder. Um, we we do refer out sometimes. Perfect. And then a couple questions on: Does insurance typically cover this? Cover this, or is it out of pocket? Unfortunately, no. They typically do not. And we bill it as neurofeedback for autism. We work with patients financially. I mean, we do everything we can do within our own, own limitations to work with families financially. We have medical finance programs for families. Um, we're able to work it out with most people that need to come to see us. But it is out of pocket. But it is a, because we're a medical clinic, it is a tax deductible medical expense. Perfect. Um, and then can, this is, I think the last question, but do you have to be able to sit for long periods of time to be able to do neurofeedback? Well, the maximum treatment session is 30 minutes. With younger autistic children that are more developmentally challenged, we may only start with 16 minutes, 15 minutes. Sometimes less is more. You know, I'll share a story with you. Eight or nine years ago, we had a child come to us. He was eight years old, had uh, a, a rare uh, genetic chromosomal disorder. 
And he had all the symptoms of autism, ADHD, couldn't read nor write. He was having bowel movements in his pants every day. And after the initial evaluation brain mapping, his mother calls me four days later and she says, Dr. Velikoff, I can't believe it. He's not had an action in his pants since the brain mapping. Could the brain mapping have helped him that much? I said, no, the brain mapping is just a, a diagnostic test. It doesn't do anything. But I said, we did a neurofeedback treatment in the evaluation, an abbreviated treatment in the evaluation. Obviously, that treatment impacted on him. She, she says, well, you know, Dr. Velikoff, I've been through every treatment in the world for my son. Nothing has made a difference. So I'm skeptical coming to you. Well, I'm not skeptical anymore after what's happened the last four days. We're so excited to start his treatment now. They start treatment. And then two weeks later, she calls me. She says, Dr. Velikoff, he's having bowel movements in his pants again. And I thought, that doesn't make sense. He should be getting better and better. So I spoke to the staff. And I found out that in the brain map evaluation appointment, we only gave him 15 minutes of neurofeedback uh, because it was just too much. He had a, a half a session. And then I, I realized his brain can't handle 30 minutes. It's too much on his brain. He needs a shorter session. So I called up the mother. I said, look, uh, don't be upset with me. We're only going to give him 15 minute treatments. That's all. She says, well, he won't get full care. I said, that's not true. When you're dealing with a child who is more developmentally brittle or fragile, you, you've, got to, you've got to deliver what their brain can handle. Less is more. Start him off on 15 minutes within a week, no longer having bob in his pants. He's doing wonderful again. So of course she pressures me to take him up to 30 minutes. I wouldn't do it. I think I took him up to 18 minutes. I never did more than 18 minutes. He improved more than any child in our clinic that year. So, Nicole, I've learned less is more if a child is really severe. So it's unusual. Rarely we'll have someone that's really untreatable. It's rare because the treatment is very engaging. My staff are very compassionate and empathetic. They know how to work with kids who are very challenged. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to sneak another question. Um, are there stronger results with younger children? Are the results fairly consistent across age ranges, have you seen? I would say the, I, the optimal window to treat is maybe five to 10 or 11. Um, we get good results at four years old. The mm -hmm. optimal window is five to 10 or 11. But again, the age is not as critical. The yeah. family dynamics, family uh, parenting, stress in the child's life are really much more critical in the age of the child. We, we could have an eight-year-old child that has a difficult time uh, because of outside stress, stress factors. We could have a 15-year-old, great family dynamics, proactive parents, wonderful environment. Kid does great. Age is not the most important factor, but if everything else is even, five to 11 is probably the, the easiest age to treat. But, you know, the youngest child I treated that was nonverbal uh, the first time was four years and two months old. And I discharged her when she recited the Lord's Prayer. It took 75 treatments, but um, when she recited the Lord's Prayer, she didn't need us anymore. Yeah. So the, the, the age, it's a secondary factor, but it is more challenging. Perfect. And, they, and they may need, if it's a four-year-old, they may need more than 42 treatments. Perfect. All right. Well, that wraps up all of the questions. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us live today. And if you're watching the recording um, and Dr. Belkoff, thank you so much for all of this information. We haven't had a presentation like this in a while. And we're just so grateful that you're able to share all your knowledge with us. Well, I, I'm very, uh, I'm very grateful and thank, thankful to, th to Taka and all of you. My best to everybody. Bye-bye. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.